Yes. 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 So we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. When he was on this earth, John says the whole world could not contain the number of miracles he did. Y'all remember that? End of book of John. It says that the world could not contain the things that Jesus did. What hasn't he done yet? Don't look angry at me. I'm not trashing Jesus. What did he not do yet? Thank you. He's coming back. Has he come back yet? No. He hasn't come back yet. And see, there is a very strong understanding throughout the scriptures about the imminent return of Christ. And there's some things that come with that. And we've got to know. I'll explain, but let me tell you what happens to believers in the world we have today. Once a believer receives salvation, and I'm all about salvation, I'm all about the gospel. I'm not just a science and wonders preacher. I never get the gospel. But once that gospel is received, what are you going to do? What does that do? Does it have something in it? See, when you look at the disciples, even though they understood the gospel, even though they understood the power of Christ, they didn't quite get it just yet. Go to look at Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1, just the background verse, Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. It says, now when he had spoken these things, this is Jesus already coming back, he's risen from the dead, he met them, they're kind of an open field, and Jesus talking. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you will so come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. Okay, let, me, let me just let me make that kind of more clear. Here's the disciples. They see Jesus risen from the dead. He begins to ascend in heaven. They do this. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yep. Time's going by. A few months. Years. Some guys have to wait. Wait for Jesus. I'm waiting for you. Angels, what do you want? What are you guys standing here for? Get to work. Uh -huh. They're basically saying, get to work. Get to work in what? Get to work in what? So that's what we got to talk about. What are you called to do? See, we talk about testimonies. You know, I was sitting there listening to the testimonies people are giving. I'm encouraged. I really am. But I like to turn the knob up just a little bit. Go ahead. I, I like music. I like to turn it up. Everybody like to turn it up? Yes. Like to put the windows down? I'm like, uh, let's turn this up. I like this. I want to turn up your testimonies. I want to change them just a little bit. All right. And I want to put a little bit of spin and some flavor on them. So what we're trying to do is get out of this disciple mentality where we're kind of waiting for Jesus because I know he's coming back. I trust him. But we get so caught up in that, we're just... We're just looking up, but we don't realize what we have, what we have in us. So we're going to talk about what I call a greater return. Okay, guys, remember that word, a greater return. A greater return. Everybody say me. A greater, a greater return. return. One more time. A greater, a greater return. return. Okay, so we're going to have a greater return. That's all right. Okay, so here's scripture tonight, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Everybody take a look, please. I want you to read it. It's kind of a, it's a parable. Please get familiar with it. Luke chapter 19, verse 11. And look up when you're ready. Okay. Now as they heard these things, looking at verse 11, now as they heard these things, he being Jesus, spoke another parable. Because he was new, near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, 
for these who are faithful and very little have authority over ten cities. We're talking about a great return. We're talking about a great return. Don't mix this with another parable about the talents, where one was given ten talents, five talents, and one talent. That's, that's, that's a book, map the book of Matthew. This is Luke 19. Everybody's given how many minas? One. one. Your faith is in one God. Right. You have one spirit, one baptism, one Lord. Right? That's Hebrews. Everybody has the same playing field. You see what I'm doing here? Yeah. We're talking about a greater return, but first we've got to level the playing field. Because if you say, Michael, you're a pastor. Kumar, you're a prophet. This other man, you're an apostle. And you try to disqualify yourself. You won't see 10 minas. You have to realize. Let's look at the parable again. Jesus was talking about the Lord who received the kingdom. He's talking about himself, right? So we have the parable that says it's Jesus talking to his servants. We are all servants of God, I like to think. Yes. The blue, so we've all received one mina. The mina being our faith. What God gave us. The supernatural, incorruptible seed of the word of the gospel. That gospel being the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God. So we have implanted to us something unique. Is it able to bear one fruit? Yes. Is it able to bear five fruits? Yes. Yeah, but can we make it ten? Uh huh. Now we're talking supernatural. A man, he's talking about a car sale. I like that testimony. You don't even know how God works and things like that. <laughs> how God is able to take a story like that. We want to increase. We want supernatural favor. We want a supernatural multiplication. Amen. Uh -huh. Multiplication. I'm throwing words at you, but if you can pick one, remember, multiplication. Now, this man was able to multiply a singular input. How did he do that? Does it say anywhere in the story about the anointing that man carried? No. We're talking business, right? Did you ever heard businessmen talking about anointing? No. I don't think so. Did it say that he was given more of the Spirit of God than this other man of the other nine? No. no. I, I don't see that in the parable. What about the gifts of the Spirit? Did that give him nine more? I don't think so. I'm very confident it started with this. Does everybody have a mind? Yes. I hope so. Yeah. You make it here. <laughs> but you got to make it home. You can't stay here. <laughs> if an hour, you got to go. So I don't know where it came from, but you got to go. So you have a mind. And that mind, I believe, renewed by the Spirit of God, is able to supernaturally multiply the ten. Now you say, am I talking money? You make it what you want. Yeah. Make it what you want. I'm not preaching wealth. I'm talking about a supernatural law of multiplication. Amen. I have more stories for you. We just got warmed up. You guys ready? Yes. We're looking for supernatural, right? Yes. Because to me, a man that can take one and make ten is very unique. Yes. And God says, man, you're fit for the kingdom. And you're fit for many. Not just one, but many. I'd like to be that guy. Amen. You remember the parable of the sower? The parable of Sora said there was four seeds. One was taken by the bird. You guys tell me the second. Second one, on the rock. On the rock, yes, it, it died, withered, it grew up and withered. Third one was about the thorns of the world. Thank you, that's my wife. The fourth one, good soil, 30, 60, 100 fold. One seed, 100 fold. So the Bible seems to talk about this multiplication. Supernatural multiplication. So do you believe, at least I want to check real quick, do you guys believe you can touch the supernatural again? Yes. Good. I think everybody believes so. So, let's look again. John chapter 14, verse 12. I'm going to read one more time. Now that we're on the same page. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus talking, John chapter 14, verse 12. I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Greater works. Well, let's look at what Jesus did to start. See what he did, because it says, you'll do that, and more. I mean, this is just black and white. Am I going too crazy? Am I talking too hot? I don't think so. That's right I don't down. think so. That's right down. What's a famous chapter I think everybody enjoys? Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. I won't read it, 
But it's a very famous story about the feeding of the 5,000. Everybody remembers that. The feeding of the 5,000. What happened is Jesus had been preaching in another city. I mean, actually in the wilderness, just kind of preaching the open field. And a multitude is following him. The disciples begin to say, Lord, send them into the local cities because it's late and they need some food. And Jesus gives them a very strange question. He says, uh, you feed them. You feed them. Now, is that, I, mean, I would be a little offended if I'm about the site. Wait, me feed them? You told me to leave everything. I don't have any money. Look at me. I got nothing thanks to you. And then Jesus says, well, what do you got? Five loaves, two fishes. There's a theme I'm, I'm kind of building here. I hope everybody sees patterns. I'm kind of, I'm kind of running this pattern right into the ground here, but we're going to see it. Five loaves, two fishes, 5,000. Men, I would easily say at least 10,000 people. Women, children. Yeah, we can say 10,000. Okay, 10,000. 10,000 people. There's five loaves, two, uh, five loaves, two fishes. Let me ask you this. Did Jesus need all five loaves? What if it was just one loaf? You could have Do you done think it. that would have stopped him? No. Why are you looking at your situation and asking God, I only had this much? See, we limit God by what we see in front of us. You have to do. I don't think Jesus even needed two fish. I think he could have made it happen like that. You know who knew that about him? I bet you'd be shocked. Who knew that about Jesus? Who? The devil. Uh oh. Play the cue on the organ. The devil knew. The devil knew that? And the believer doesn't? Now we have a problem. Let's uh, rewind. Get some light stairs. Jesus finishes his 40 day fast. He's hungry. I'm hungry after one hour of fasting. You know, that's oh, right. Lord. Yes. I'm praying. Yes. <laughs> Everything looks good when you're fasting. Yes. I drive by a billboard when I'm fasting. I see a hamburger. My mouth salivates. Not the restaurant, the billboard. <laughs> Water burger. Amen. You're right. It is amazing. <laughs> Why didn't I know that? Thank you for telling me. <laughs> so I start salivating. Okay, this is me. So Jesus has finished his 40 day fast. And this man shows up called the devil. He sees he's fasting and says, Hey, if you're the Son of God, turn that stone into bread. Do you think Jesus can do it? Why was he tempted? Do you think he was tempting him with something stupid? Do you think the devil knew Jesus could have made a stone bread? How's that for challenging your faith? How's that for going beyond five loaves? The devil knew that. See, you guys forget. The devil's always after what you got. You know what? He was in heaven too. He's like that irritating ex-friend that hangs around. He's calling. Go away. He knows what the kingdom looked like because he was there. It didn't say that God wiped his brain when Adam ate the fruit and was kicked out of Eden. Was his brain wiped? No. Why do you think the devil's brain was wiped? He knows what Jesus can do. And if Jesus can turn stone into bread, he knew it and said, you turn that into bread. But believers still fight over scraps. Give me that. Nobody else will fight over it. No, that's mine. We're fighting over something. Jesus like, I can turn stones into bread. Sad. Sad. We gotta go beyond our circumstances. Beyond our circumstances. So, we're gonna look at the parable again. What did the master say? Let's look at it together. Okay, he called ten of his servants in verse 13, delivered them ten minas, and said what? Do business. Do business. Do business, ma'am, do business. Do you think that was a like a soft request? That was a commandment. Do you think that was like, hey, hey, can y'all do some business for me? It said those were his servants. And that was the master saying, I want you to go do business. I'm going to go upstairs, get what's mine. And when I come back, in that meantime, do business. Yes. What kind of business, guys? Kingdom business. Yes. Kingdom business. I like kingdom business. 
You know what? Kingdom business doesn't play by the rules of this world. Oh, you guys are over here. I'll get over here. Yeah. Yeah. Kingdom business does not play by the rules of this world. If that doesn't make you celebrate, I don't know what to tell you. It makes me celebrate. Kingdom business is an entirely different realm of the understanding you guys are under. See, I don't want to throw heavy bricks at people just yet. But your testimonies can be taken up to another level when you begin to understand what God is doing. See, God does work through people's lives. And He gives you an opportunity to step out further. Now, you can stop at first base. That's okay. But I can show you how to get to a home run. Because if I tell you what kingdom business looks like, you're coming all the way home. And you'll celebrate. You want to say, praise the Lord. But you're going to say, you guys won't believe what God just did. It threw my own hands. You see it. See, we have to understand what kingdom business means. Let me tell you something. I know in here, there are businessmen. Whether you see it, my eyes, God can be a unique thing, but I can see businessmen. I can see it. So, how does a businessman succeed? He plays by the rule of business. Okay. Let's say I start a car inspection shop. The state of Texas has laws. Now, I don't know about you South Carolina people. You guys saw you crazy people. Yeah, we are. But in Houston, yeah, we, are. we have rules. We have speed limits that we ignore. We have red lights that are just suggestions. <laughs> Turn signals. I don't think they use I think that's, not, that's an option on a car. It must be because most cars don't use them in Houston. Sure don't. <laughs> that's all right. You're welcome to come. So, we have laws. And in, in that city, if I wanted a business that had uh, you know, a car inspection shop, I have rules. I have regulations. And for me to succeed, I have to understand them. Is that fair? Yes. Okay? If I'm playing a basketball game, I like basketball. If I don't play by the rules, I can't win. So even though you are children of God, and God loves to give you the kingdom, if you don't know what the kingdom looks like, or how it works, it just will seem difficult. And God puts his children in the kingdom for that reason. And then we don't know what to do. We say, you abandoned me, or you're not using me, right. or you're called this man, or right. me, or somebody else, but why not me? Right, right. He's like, I put you in a place to succeed. It won't look like that to a natural man, but to a kingdom-minded man or woman, they'll understand. So, I gave you one of them. Supernatural multiplication. Supernatural. See, this word supernatural gets thrown around a lot. It's like, oh, you crazy Christians. You just make up words as you go. The world knows it's supernatural. To the kingdom of God, this is just a law. This is just a function of the kingdom. It's not special. It's not something unique. It is the kingdom of God to be supernaturally increased. A multiplication. To increase. So when Jesus began to tell them, you feed them, he wasn't mocking him. He just said, you're with me now. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Try it. When he raised the dead people, did he ever say the hallelujah? <laughs> he said, God, I thank you that you hear me because of them. And they said, Lazarus, come on out. He came up. Luke chapter 9, the widow of Dain. Only son being carried out of the casket. The whole city is weeping. I love this story. It makes me weep. He walks to town. He sees them all coming out. Puts his hand on the casket. They stop. Sees them all crying. Says, young man, get up. And they say, great prophet is risen among us. Okay. At that time, the veil wasn't torn. God was using prophets and apostles. Here we are, New Testament. We have the Spirit of God where? In here. In here. All of you have it. Your Bible tells you that. Three different places at the very least. It's in here. You have the unlimited potential of God inside of you. You have to look at yourself and tell yourself that. You have to say, Holy Spirit, you're in here. Yes. The same power, the same anointing Christ had yes. when the dove laid on him, that thing is actually right here. Yes, right? Right. I'm yes. not saying the Holy Spirit's not in the world, too. It's there. It's everywhere. But for you to begin to operate in the kingdom of God, you have to recognize yes. there's, the source of power comes here. And now here you are, as a child of God, born again, filled with the Spirit, now you're thrust into the kingdom of God. And believe it or not, there's many spiritual laws. I just came to talk to you about multiplication. 
So, we'll go back to an old story. An old story. That's one of my favorites. Because up to now, I told you about Jesus. I don't like to tell you, well, maybe you know, Paul or Peter, I can go there. Ezekiel chapter 37, I love that story. Everybody remember, is this the Valley of the Dry Bones? Yeah. Ezekiel 37. He's taken the Spirit. He's shown a valley, very large, with many bones, and they're very dry. And God tells Ezekiel, you talk and say, tell these bones to come together. So you want to understand the kingdom, you've got to open your mouth a little bit. Too often we are too busy challenging each other for a microphone. There's plenty of opportunity outside of preach. There's plenty of opportunity in your job place. Okay? So we don't need to fight. You go to a job site like mine. Nobody there loves God. Maybe about two people out of the 170. I pray for healing of people. I yeah. prophesy where people work. It's good. I minister to them at my job site. Good. I don't like to fight for a pulpit. I don't have to wait my turn. It's just there. It comes to me. You pray for two people at work. It, they come back to you. You don't have to look for them. They'll come to you. And there's times out of my own sorrow that I don't pray for people. I just for work. I just try to be fair. So let's look at Ezekiel 37. God uses him to raise up how big an army. And in verse 10 it says, an exceedingly great army. Exceedingly great army. Okay? So God is talking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel talks to the dry bones. Here's why that's important to you. We're going to look at multiplication. Those dry bones can't hear God. They hear who? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. You. So you say, how does, my, how does multiplication work? Very simply. You. You have the Spirit of God. You have the power of God. God is telling you through His Word, operating out of your spirit, to talk to it. It's not hard. You say, that's an Old Testament story, brother. I say, simple. Back then, the Spirit of God came and went when it chose. That's right. You want to look at Old Testament and get hardcore? See how the Spirit of God worked. It just came and went. That's it. Came and went. Ezekiel says, the Spirit of God was all upon me. I started prophesying, and it left. That's right. That's it. Look at the kings. It says the Spirit of God would just come. Zap a guy. He would prophesy. The Spirit of God would leave. So when you look at Old Testament prophecy, it wasn't really all that. I mean, it was good. But you got something better. 2 Corinthians 3 says you have a greater ministry because of the Spirit than that of Moses. If we get more breath, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says you have a greater ministry in the Spirit than that of Moses. It's a statement. Moses needed a rock. Yes, he did. You have the Spirit. So, let's go back. One more story. One more story. And then I'm going to minister to the group. We'll finish it up with personal prayer. But I want to show you how God touches. Come on now. I got two more points about this. You ready? Come on. See, she told you I was a church pastor. I am. I don't see myself that way some days, but <laughs> they're waiting for me to talk. I come to church. I take the microphone. People start listening. It surprises me. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm sitting there, I think somebody's going to get up and start. And I'm excited. I'm like, you, you, all right. You got and I guess I'm going to stay up and start talking. I have to preach Sunday. I guess something will happen. So, as a pastor, I know you love that kind of talk as a pastor. I love the pastor that's so kind of me, the gentleman in the back. Thank you, sir. Woo! Very kind of me. Yes, he is. Yeah. Welcome me as a brother. Thank you, sir. I respect elders. I'm big on that. So, whether he wants to admit it, I'll admit it. Pastors talk about church growth occasionally. Church growth. I'm interested in church growth, but I like what the Bible does with church growth. Acts chapter 2. Yeah. What happened in Acts chapter 2? Starts with a P. This way. P E Pentecost. 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 Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit and fire. That's another sermon. After that, a fisherman that cussed out some children <laughs> preaches a sermon and says, Repent all of you. And how many get added in one day? 3,000. 3,000. That's multitude. That's multiplication. Guys, that's spiritual. You talk about, are you talking money? I can talk about money. I can talk about health. I can talk about church growth. I can talk about your job situation. I can talk about an increase that you've been waiting for. I'm talking about promotion you've been looking for. I can talk about a lot of things. I want to know how far you're ready. So, Peter preaches a sermon, and 3,000 get added in one sermon. See, as a pastor, I like that. 
I like that story. It brings me courage. Because one day, I might stand up and maybe you know, my mom comes. <laughs> we'll pray for your mom. <laughs> so, two chapters later, Acts chapter 4, they get confronted, threatened for preaching and healing the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. Chapter 3, and then 4, they're told, don't do that. It says at that point, 5,000. Yeah. Or at the church, they're told, 5,000. So in four chapters, I have 5,000 people. We have all these books for church growth and magazines. And I, one time, I got, I got bored, I Googled it, and I got tired of it. I don't got time for that. I ain't nobody got time for that. I like the Spirit. I like how the Spirit ministers and can give 5,000 two sermons. One because of a healing, one because of a sermon. Me and Peter would get along for you. Yeah. So, what about you guys? See, I could go on and on and on. Gideon, you want to reverse it? Uh, Gideon slayed several thousand many nights. How many? 300. David and Solomon took a relatively small kingdom of Israel and became what? Global superpower. Saul slayed thousands. David slayed ten thousands. Go all night. So here's where we're going to come together. See, what you have to realize is whatever situation you're in, the Spirit of God is already there. You need to surprise the Spirit of God with your problem. He knew that problem. Surprise. Yeah, he did. The question is you give it something to eat, or you give it something to change. You, you, you. Jesus was challenging them. You, you. One of my favorite verses. verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we are among you for your sake. Why do I like the verse? I like the word power. I like the Holy Spirit. So you guys stand up. I'm going to challenge you. With that feeding of 5,000 people, did they even understand what was happening that day? I don't think so. But they ate. They ate to their full, such that there were 12 baskets left. You mind singing a song real quick? Is that possible? Can we sing? We're going to minister. And see, here's what the Holy Spirit told me before I came here. God says to me, He says, and I can hear Him talking, I see a multitude. We're not talking hungry for just food. You're hungry for life. Yeah. Spirit of God says you need life. You want that abundant life that God talked about in John chapter 10. God's telling me you want that breakthrough for your family, for that marriage. Some of you have friends that are going through a divorce or on the brink of divorce. And you're saying, God, can you use me to change that? See, when the Spirit of God pours out, it's more than just 5,000 being fed. It's the power of God to touch everybody, not just more than power. Hmm. God's about to touch this church. Yes. God's about to fill this place yes. with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We're going to sing a song just real quickly, and we'll do it together for your great. <laughs> 